This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yuwat. It's Wednesday, August 19th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VO headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. We begin our broadcast in West Africa, where soldiers who ousted Malian President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita and his government in a military coup that quickly drew condemnation abroad are promising on Wednesday to restore stability and oversee a transition to elections within a reasonable period of time. President Keita resigned on Tuesday and dissolved parliament hours after mutinying soldiers detained him at gunpoint plunging a country already facing a jihadist insurgency and mass protests deeper into turmoil. Gloria Sol has the details. Mali's President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita resigned on Tuesday and dissolved parliament, plunging the country into deeper political crisis amid military mutiny and mass protests. Protesters have been calling for Keita to resign, blaming him for corruption and worsening security in the north and center of the West African country, where Islamist militants are active. Wearing a surgical mask, Keita resigned in a brief address broadcast on state television. If today certain elements of our armed forces want this to end through their intervention, do I really have a choice? Keita's address came shortly after mutinying soldiers seized him and several other top officials, detaining them at the Kati military base outside the capital Bamako earlier on Tuesday. It was not immediately clear who was leading the revolt, who would govern in Keita's absence, or what the mutineers wanted. But hundreds of anti-government protesters poured into a central square in Bamako to celebrate Keita's rumored detention. They cheered on the mutineers, who drove through in military vehicles and fired rounds of celebratory gunfire. International reaction to the news has been swift. France and other international powers, as well as the African Union, denounced the mutiny, fearful that Keita's fall could further destabilize the former French colony and West Africa's entire Sahel region. The United Nations also called for the immediate release of Keita and other detainees. Gloria Saw of Reuters with that report. As coronavirus infections rise in Namibia, government officials are warning citizens not to trust claims posted on social media that elephant dung can cure COVID-19. Ministry of Environment, Forestry and Tourism spokesman Romeo Muyunda told Reuters the government has observed that elephant dung was increasingly being touted as a coronavirus cure. He says people are selling elephant dung on social media at exorbitant prices. Health Minister Kalumbi Shangula says any claims about elephant dung curing COVID-19 must be treated as a false claim. Some traditional healers say elephant dung has healing properties, including for treating headaches, toothaches, and blocked sinuses. But claiming it can cure COVID-19 is a new trend. Namibia has just over 4,400 coronavirus infections and 37 deaths, according to Johns Hopkins University. Meanwhile, dozens of doctors in Homa Bay and Embu, two of Kenya's 47 counties, are now on strike over delayed salaries, inadequate personal protective equipment for handling COVID-19 patients, and lack of medical insurance, according to Alan Ochanji, Vice Chairman of the Kenya Medical Practitioners, Pharmacists and Dentists Union. Healthcare workers say they have not been given adequate PPE, but the government disputes their claim and says it has distributed enough for everyone. Kenya has a total of over 30,000 confirmed infections with 487 deaths, according to Johns Hopkins University data. Doctors in Libya are bracing for a surge in serious coronavirus cases as the infection rate has soared in recent weeks. The conflict-torn North African country has over 8,500 infections, according to Johns Hopkins University. 
but the true figure is likely to be much higher. As Henry Rijo reports, authorities are urging people to adhere to social distancing to slow the spread of the disease. At the Benghazi Medical Center, staff fear this is the calm before the storm. Infection rates in Libya are rising fast, with several hundred new cases recorded every day. But accurate data is difficult to come by in a country racked by war. Our tools and resources are ready to receive only a limited number of people, but if we get a surge in numbers, we won't be able to cope. Officials fear they are losing control of the disease outbreak. Hotspots include the capital Tripoli and Misrata in the west and the city of Sabah in the south. Medics say public behavior is to blame. If people still go on with their lives without paying attention to these dangers, meeting up in gatherings and weddings, meeting in malls and not taking the precautionary measures agreed upon by all health organizations, then I fear that things will get worse very soon. In West Libya, people are required to wear face masks in public areas. In the East, run by a different administration, there is no such law. With the economy severely weakened by years of conflict, many people say they can't afford to buy masks. The ongoing war between rival factions has destroyed many medical facilities. Those that remain are under-resourced with shortages of PPE and testing kits. Frequent summer power outages make life even more difficult for hospital staff. Health experts warn of potential catastrophe. The capacity of health systems to be able to deal with the surge of infections, particularly those requiring more advanced care, like ventilators, um, is just not going to be possible there. Also, there are fears for the health of the thousands of migrants in Libya trying to reach Europe. The United Nations last month reopened this Tripoli clinic that had closed at the start of the pandemic in March. It serves more than 30,000 people in the capital. We're working here with this facility to provide uh, free of charge healthcare access for, for all, regardless of their background. Tests on some migrants arriving by boat to Malta and Italy from Libya in recent months showed high coronavirus infection rates. Those affected were quarantined on arrival. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. Trying to woo passengers into flying again. U.S. airlines announced they are taking some new steps to protect travelers from COVID-19. This comes as the number of people flying is once again decreasing. Airlines such as Delta, which recently posted a nearly $6 billion loss for the second quarter, and many other airlines are encouraging employees to uh, retire early to reduce the need for layoffs in October when federal payroll expires. VOA's Maria Madialo has the story. For months, airlines have been trying to assure a frightened public that flying is safe and won't expose them to the coronavirus. But people are still not convinced as the number of confirmed cases in the U.S. surpassed 5.4 million this week and more than 170,000 have died from the illness. Delta Airlines flight attendant Jason Bond says he's never seen anything like this in his 23-year career. I've been through SARS, bird flu, all those different flus that have come out, 9-11. You know, I think this is even worse than, if you talk to other pilots and flight attendants, this is, this is worse than 9-11. Industry experts say air travel has not picked up as it should even after a few months of gradual increase. Last week, the number of people passing through U.S. airports fell for the first time since April. Airline executives cited a resurgence in reported coronavirus infections as a reason for the decline. No matter how much time it takes, we will always go through the cleaning process and make sure the cleaning specs are met. And if that means that we will um, compromise an on-time departure so that our aircraft are clean, we will do just that. Delta recently announced additional health screenings for passengers who say they cannot wear a mask for health reasons before being allowed to board a plane. We want to ensure that our customers and our employees feel safe and coming to work and being in an airport environment that's clean and disinfected and knowing that we're taking every precaution possible. United Airlines said it will increase the flow of air through filtration systems during boarding and deplaning 
which it said would make the air cleaner than in restaurants and grocery stores. To create more space between passengers, Delta, Southwest, and JetBlue are keeping some seats open, even if it's not the two meters of social distancing that health experts recommend. Maria Magello, VOA News, Washington. Frontline medical workers are bearing the brunt of the COVID-19 pandemic, but as VOA's Jeff Swickard reports from Washington, D.C., a local doctor, while worried, finds hope in the crisis. I first actually got interested in medicine when I was about seven years old. I had a typhoid fever, which is really unusual. I was very sick and I was in the hospital for 18 days. After that, I, uh, I felt pulled towards medicine. You know, there's something about uh, the chance to take care of people when they're at their most vulnerable that, that really spoke to me. So that, that sort of always stuck. I don't think that anyone thought in our lifetimes we would see anything like coronavirus. Life on the COVID wards is both uh, uh, rewarding and tense. There is an understanding of what this disease is and what it can do. And so, you know, the way that we pay attention to donning and doffing the uh, personal protective equipment, how frequently nurses, therapists, people who do tests, physicians uh, go into the rooms, people who are sick and, and very uncomfortable have the chance to get better. And people do get better. I think that that's an important thing to remember about coronavirus is that it is a disease that lots of people can recover from. And, and the chance to be a part of that, I think, is really rewarding. Yeah. Everyone's life has changed as a result of coronavirus. And our, our lives as physicians is no different in that way. And so switching like, from uh, an in-office-based practice to a virtual practice, we, we were able to do that part relatively quickly. And now I worry that my heart patients are scared to seek care because they're worried about getting coronavirus in, in the hospital. And I worry about the patients with coronavirus that they're going to have some devastating complication. Uh, and so you worry in both directions, which I think is, is a new feeling um, uh, for all of us. Many of us worry about being a vector for our families. Um, I, I think that that's something that's on all of our minds. You know, my, my wife and kids, if something happened to them, it would be uh, devastating. My greatest fear is that I'm going to give it to my parents. They are in that higher risk category. Uh, we're cognizant of the risks associated with being a healthcare worker. Medical knowledge has undertaken this grand revolution because of the pandemic. I think that a wider swath of medical professionals have learned how to quickly interpret data and understand what is good data and bad data in a, in a way that we've never been able to do before. It helped us move faster through the science of coronavirus. I think that we are better prepared now than we were two months ago. We'll be better prepared in a month than we are now. Uh, because I think the way that we are interpreting and understanding knowledge has fundamentally changed in really, really positive ways, in really positive ways. One of the positive things the COVID-19 pandemic has brought is a renewed appreciation for the solid waste workers in the United States. They risk their health every day to keep our environment clean and preserve public health. VOA's Veronica Balderas Iglesias looks at what is needed to better protect these essential workers. The residents um, didn't really appreciate us in the beginning because they just thought we were trash. I mean, you bring your trash to us, but we're not trash. The perception is changing, though, says Dinita Glenn, who has spent a long career in the solid waste industry. She now works at a Virginia transfer station, where some employees have been out because of COVID-19. Some people have gotten sick and they've gotten family members and uh, household members that have been sick and, and they need to be tended to. There are more than 400,000 solid waste workers in the United States. And with a 25% increase in residential trash due to coronavirus lockdowns, they are needed more than ever. If garbage sits on the street for even a few days, it creates a public health problem. The garbage uh, contains pathogens, um, it generates liquid if it rains. Epidemiologists say handling waste is not what puts sanitation workers at higher risk of the virus. It's actually their interactions with the community and their increased exposure time as essential workers. A person who is infected, who is coughing, sneezing, speaking, singing, um, and doing any of those things 
can transmit respiratory droplets and even small, small droplets we call aerosols. Nationwide, not all sanitation workers have had prompt access to protective gear. Republic Services, the second largest trash hauler in the nation, has seen protests over safe working conditions. I think in the early days, folks were concerned, and, the, and they were rightly concerned because there were a lot of unknowns. We had to obviously consider social distancing, uh, all the appropriate PPE. We're doing the sanitizing uh, multiple times on a daily basis. While agreeing that things are better, the Union for Republic's workers say there is still a problem with the company policy of giving employees with COVID-19 an additional 10 paydays off. We learned out later that workers who were told to self-quarantine and tested negative were forced to use their sick days and their uh, vacation days to compensate for this. This just encourages you to come in sick. The union also wants Republic to be more forthcoming about the number of infected workers. Advocates for essential workers say the risk of getting sick deserves more than just thanks. In some locations, the employers have been providing hazard pay, extra money on an hourly basis to workers. That's still the exception, not the rule in the industry. They deserve it. I mean, just dealing with a lot of traffic on a day-to-day -day basis, not only are your residents, but you've got your commercial haulers as well, and sometimes it isn't very pleasant. Pleasant or not, Glenn has kept her sense of service and humor. The Solid Waste Management Program, we're always at your disposal, we'll never refuse you, and we talk trash every day, all day. Veronica Valeras Iglesias for VOA News, Virginia. We'll be right back. The Democratic Party is known for favoring a larger federal government as well as liberal social policies. However, this was not always the case. In 1792, when founding fathers Thomas Jefferson and James Madison formed the Democratic Republican Party, which will later become the Democratic Party, they want the federal government to have a smaller role and more people involved in the democratic process, not just the elite. In 1829, President Andrew Jackson expands on those ideals. He wants an even smaller federal government and champions enlarging the electorate to all white men from just landowners. African American men do not gain the right to vote until 1870, and women gain the right to vote in 1920. The Democratic Party splits geographically in 1860 in the lead up to the Civil War. Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats disagree over the issue of slavery and preserving the Union. When the South loses the Civil War in 1865, the Democratic Party loses its national prominence for several generations, while the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln dominates the political landscape. By 1912, when the first Southern Democrat is elected president since the end of the Civil War, the party has become more progressive. President Woodrow Wilson champions the woman's vote, which is ratified in 1920. It isn't until the Great Depression when Democrats regain their political dominance, led by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who expands the role of the federal government. Many African American voters switched to the Democratic Party because of Roosevelt's policies. In the mid-1960s, Lyndon Johnson passes civil rights legislation as well as more government social programs. In recent decades, Democrats and Republicans have traded control over the presidency. The most recent Democratic president, Barack Obama, is the first African-American president, and he expanded the government's role in health care. Welcome back to Africa 54. U.S. Democrats formally nominated former Vice President Joe Biden as their candidate for president Tuesday during the second night of a virtual convention that included criticism of President Donald Trump from Republicans as well as Democrats and personal stories of Biden as a public servant, father, and husband. White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara has this story from Wilmington, Delaware. 
I have always loved the Capping the second night of the Democratic National Convention, the woman who could be the next First Lady, Jill Biden, highlighted the pandemic's impact on children and families and spoke of her husband from a high school classroom where she used to teach in the Biden's hometown of Wilmington, Delaware. How do you make a broken family whole? The same way you make a nation whole. With love and understanding and with small acts of kindness. Just as on the first night, Republicans lined up to support Biden, including Colin Powell, the retired four-star general and secretary of state under President George W. Bush, who said Joe Biden would make a responsible commander-in-chief. For Joe Biden, that doesn't need teaching. It comes from the experience he shares with millions of military families, sending his beloved son off to war and praying to God he would come home safe. Their presence highlights the white tent message of unity that Democrats want to convey, targeting moderate Republicans and independents. But ideology is not the only divide the Democrats are seeking to bridge. On Tuesday, they focus on another divide, the generational gap, where old guards will share the spotlight with young rising stars. You know what Donald Trump will do with four more years? Blame, bully, and belittle. And you know what Joe Biden will do? Build back better. We stand with Joe Biden because this isn't just about defeating Donald Trump. We are in this to win for America. And the great state of Alabama casts 52 votes. Everything is done virtually, including the traditional roll call, where delegates cast their votes based on the result of each state's primary or caucus. We're going to look back on this and call it the Zoom convention because I think some of the moments that might have seemed awkward or might have seen like the picture was a little grainy, I think that's part of many of our lived experience now. And more to the point is in fact how we are having relationships in some cases with coworkers, family members, people that we care about. On Wednesday night, the Democratic National Convention will continue with California Senator as Kamala said, Harris so delivering her acceptance speech as the vice presidential nominee, president. making history as the first black woman and South Asian American on a national U.S. political After ticket. From Wilmington, runner, Delaware, Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News. In our tech report, Rwanda is currently experiencing a quiet digital revolution. Young Rwandans are providing digital solutions to the challenges facing small-scale farmers, Spiderbit, a tech startup, and the creator Ihaho, an e-commerce platform for agricultural products, is connecting farmers to buyers and offering a fresh perspective to an old farming system. Africa 54 technology reporter Paul Ndiho spoke to Davis Mugira, CEO and founder of Spiderbit in Kigali, Rwanda. Davis and Mugira, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you, Paul. You run a tech uh, farm in Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, bring me up to speed and uh, what is it that you've done differently uh, to make sure that uh, your business uh, stays alive uh, during this time of uh, COVID-19? Like any other business, this was uh, an unprecedented time. So every, every business was kind of caught off guard. Uh, same applied to Spiderbit, it's a tech company. We, we have two solutions. Uh, one is an ELP, of course, looking at the business uh, management, like the HR operations, mm -hmm. accounting, the project management, customer relationship management, procurement. Uh, more focused, like where we plan to go, is the the e-commerce e in agriculture, uh, uh, connecting farmers to the market, and uh, other farm inputs. We focused on uh, uh, rebuilding our product, but uh, what we did in in response to to respond to COVID, uh, there was a big uh, challenge of since there was lockdown and uh, moving up country wasn't easy. So farmers were calling us that we have the produce. And uh, at the same time, in the cities, like food markets, where the stocks were running down. So we're looking at this problem. How do we uh, contribute to how, what is our, our role into this? The platform is called IHAHO. It's an e-commerce platform uh, connecting farmers to the buyers. And uh, of takers, 
uh, uh, the farmers put the produce on the platform using their future phones, not necessarily a smartphone. And then the, the, the produce goes on the platform. They put the prices, the quantities, locations, and uh, the buyers go on the platform and look uh, at the, the produce of their choice, depending on the quantities, depending on the prices, depending on the locations, and then they, they do make order. So this is a service. We give the service to the, to the farmers, and then we give the service to the buyers. But we have more, as an e-commerce, we have more futures, whereby we, we also facilitate remote agro-dealers to buy the produce, not necessarily coming to the city. They make orders, we deliver. How, how many people do use your platform? Uh, as of now, it is close to 9,000 users. Wonder like uh, most uh, African countries, uh, agriculture is the backbone of uh, their economy. Where do you see uh, the kind of technology or the kind of service that uh, you're offering uh, uh, taking uh, farming in Rwanda? We want to move the agriculture into a commercial farming. We want to drive youth uh, involvement into the agriculture. And uh, many, many youth now are, are trying to, to, to join agriculture to start uh, doing commercial farming. So it can't easily happen without uh, the growth of different uh, sectors. That is like ICT in agriculture has to be there. Infrastructure has to be there. Logistics has to be really uh, well operating. So these uh, uh, more more uh, add-ons to the, to the sector to move into from the subsistence into commercial farming. Your president, uh, His Excellency Paul Kagame, is big on ICT. He has been promoting ICT in that country. Uh, earlier, you also mentioned, uh, you talked about the fact that uh, there is little penetration of the internet uh, access to cell phones uh, in the rural areas. Uh, so uh, how do you see this play out? Our president has actually championed this, the, the, the use of ICT. There is a huge of infrastructure. They have laid uh, cables, uh, optic fibers across the country. There is more initiatives that come up building on what is being actually built. In terms of uh, uh, changing the business operations in the agriculture sector, because if a farmer is having a smartphone, probably won't fail to get uh, like 100 MBs uh, to, to be able to access information be the calendar information, be the uh, weather information, be the market information, be edu content, it will be easy. Thank you so much, David. Thanks, Paul, for having us. That was Africa 54's tech reporter, Paul Ndiho, speaking to Davis Mugira, CEO and founder of Spiderbit in Kigali, Rwanda. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website, at voaafrica.com from all of us here in Washington. Thank you for watching.